Jesus was a rock star. With that said, we say this little prayer every week before we have our time together. We'll be going through the principles in this over the next four weeks. But if you would, pray with me and say, Jesus, help me to be what you want me to be. Do what you want me to do. Because people without you go to hell. my abrupt ending. I should have faded that a little better. Would have been good. Last week, we were walking through John chapter 3. Uh, I think it was verses 3 through 6 that we got through last week. And, um, and, it, and we're looking at this conversation that Jesus uh, is having with, with Nicodemus. Okay, and, and Nicodemus is, uh, just a quick idea of who he is. Uh, he was a Jewish scholar. He was a Jewish leader. He was a member of the Sanhedrin, which was the court that uh, didn't want, that got Jesus killed. They couldn't sentence him to death, so they brought him to Pilate. That was the Sanhedrin. Uh, Nicodemus was actually on that. As a matter of fact, at one point, Nicodemus tries to defend Jesus, and they yell at him, oh, what are you, some kind of Galilean just like that, Jesus? And, and so he, he at one point tries to stand up for Jesus. Uh, he also was one of two people who took the body of Christ and embalmed him and placed him in the tomb. Uh, Nicodemus was a part of that. We don't know, at least I have not been able to find uh, much about Nicodemus after that. Uh, we don't really see him in the book of Acts. If you've seen him there, let me know. I couldn't find him. Um, there's, uh, there's some legends of what he might have done afterward, but uh, nothing that is, that is in the scripture. But th- he was a Pharisee, and he was a, a Jewish guy and he is the one and this is what we looked at last week <clears throat> he said he, he's the one who really messes up with being born again that thing that we have about being born again came from this conversation with Nicodemus uh, verse 5 it says Jesus replied I assure you no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit and we unpacked last week and you can go and watch that if you want um, what that water and spirit, what was he actually talking about? And we, of course, the water we said represents um, repentance and spirit is grace. So you could say you have to be born of both repentance and grace. And uh, I won't convince you of that now, but you can watch last week. We take a, a pretty deep dive in the, in the Greek on that one. But then, so we did that last week, and to be honest with you, I hadn't really dived into the second part of that verse. I kind of planned on just stopping there with you. <clears throat> so Monday morning, I'm reading my Bible, and, and then I come across this verse. You know, humans can reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. Well, I you know, had that pretty well you know, figured out. So don't be surprised when I say to you, you must be born again. Remember last week we learned that born again uh, meant it was, Jesus was having fun with a pun uh, because born again in the Greek means to be born out of your mom, but it also means to come from above. So Jesus is, is really messing with Nicodemus uh, with the pun where it's kind of almost like a dad joke type thing because dad jokes are a lot of puns. And so I think Jesus is dad joking uh, uh, Nicodemus. But then comes this hard verse, and the language makes it kind of hard. And scholars have, you know, kind of argued some, you know, what exactly what is being talked about here. But accepting this verse is really hard, and that's where we find ourselves in John chapter 3, verse 8. Also keep in mind that we're working up to John 3, 16, where Jesus, you all know that one, for God so loved the world, whoever gave his only son, whoever believes in him will not perish but have 
everlasting life. We're working up to that. So this whole born again, how, how are you saved is what this is. So John 3, 8. The wind blows wherever it wants, just as you hear the wind, but you can't tell where it comes from or where it's going. So you can't explain how people are born of the Spirit. Now, in the, when I was younger, I used to read that. You can't explain people born of the Spirit. In other words, those people born of the Spirit, they're just a little bit out there, okay? You, but that's not what it's saying at all. So if you ever read it that way, that's not what it says. It's not saying you can't explain. Um, but, but here is the fun part, and I've known this for a while, so this isn't the, uh, you know, the, the big thing, but in the Scripture, if you were to read this in Greek, and actually even Hebrew, um, this wind and spirit are the same word in the Greek. And we could dive into why all of that. And just, and just to prove that to you a little bit, uh, we have here that's, uh, and actually, uh, wind is, is pneuma, spirit is pneuma, and that those, it's exactly the same word. You could go home, and if you've got a, a cheapo $20 strong concordance, you could look this up for yourself. And then, this is, I think I, we have how to say it here. Oh, right there. Pnevma. Pnevma is how you Pnevma. say it. And so Jesus uh, is, is talking with Nicodemus, and, and he uses um, the, the pun again. And again, last week we had... Anothen. Uh, we had Anothen. Anothen. Which is to be born again. Anothen. Both born from a woman and also born uh, to come down from above. But this word... This, this, the spirit of word, Jesus is Pnevma. drawing a, par a parallel between wind and, and spirit. He, Jesus is drawing a, parable, a, a parallel with us, and it's, it's, it's to help, try to help us understand. Um, it, it's our ability... Uh, it, in our ability to understand what he's doing. Okay, let's, we, I, I, I may not have put this verse in here again. I didn't. We're going to back up a little and look at, the, and look at that verse again because we need to. The wind blows wherever it wants. Now, again, you could say the spirit blows wind. It's the same word in the, in the Greek. Just as you hear the wind, but you can't tell where it comes from or where it's going, so you can't explain how people are born of the spirit. And so Jesus is, what's he saying here? He's, he's using a pun again because he's messing with poor Nicodemus, right? And, and, he, and he's got the same word twice, the wind and people born of the spirit. And, but then he says, so you can't explain. So he says, you can't, you don't know where the wind is. You can't see the wind. You don't know where it came from. You don't know where it's going. You just don't know the wind. Now you might be thinking to yourself, yeah, but we know where the wind is. We know it comes out of the north. We know it goes this way. We know it's going to come from the south tomorrow. Well, that's why you got to read the scripture in the context. They didn't have meteorologists. So when, when Jesus was saying that you don't know where the wind is going, he's like, yeah, you, you just don't know where the wind is going. You have no idea where the wind is going. You don't know where it's been. You don't know where it's going. You don't know why it's here. So in the same way Jesus is saying, just like you don't know where the wind is going, all right? So you can't explain how people are born of the Spirit. Jesus is basically saying, you're not going to understand God. You're not going to understand where he's been. And you are sure, as Tutin, not going to understand where he's going. <laughs> okay? You're not going to understand it. Now, we know how to live our... We have lots of wisdom from him, but you're not going to understand. He said, well, yeah, but doesn't the Bible tell me all kinds of things about God? And, and so, it, no, Jesus is saying, your ability to understand what he's doing is like your ability to understand the wind. So I got, I got just thinking a little bit, you know, what, are there some other Bible characters that <clears throat> maybe didn't understand what in the world um, the Lord was up to? And and actually, uh, if you look at, you pick your, your favorite Bible character, it's a pretty common thing that none of them had a clue what God was up to. Um, we, we see in, in Abraham, he's called to a land he did not know. And many times God gave, Ab talked to Abraham and made that same promise over and over again. I'm going to make your descendants as great as the sands on the seashore. 
But it doesn't happen right away. Well, he has to wait for it for a long time. Then he only has one kid, right? And, and he has this promise, and he goes to a land that he did not know. He didn't understand at all. He didn't see the big picture. He didn't know that it was God's plan to bring the Messiah through his family tree that would fix this incredible sin problem that we have. He didn't know that. All he knew was the next thing to do. He ended up in Egypt for a while. He did this for a while. He had that big fiasco with his uh, nephew Lot and all that he was going through. And then Lot's kids, woof, they were really messed up, Lot's kids. But all of this stuff is, is happening, and he didn't understand. He didn't see God's plan. This is before Moses. He didn't even have the Pentateuch to look at. This is before Moses. And so he is just having faith in God. And all he had to go on was the next thing. So how about Gideon? Now, we all know, you know the story of Gideon. Gideon was the one who was the judge in Israel. Uh, same office that Samson held. He did a better job than Samson, actually. But um, the same, same title that, that Samson held. And he's the one who, he had thousands of people, and then God said, that's too many, that's too many. So finally, he only had 300 warriors to take out this huge army. And so that, that one probably made it to your children's Bible. Okay, but how if do you remember how Gideon was called this um, prophet comes up to Gideon, hey Gideon, God wants you to be the, the savior. He wants you to do great things. So what you got to do is uh, kill your dad's ox and uh, sacrifice them and use your plow as an altar and, and stuff. And so he, he does that. Now, can you imagine any of you grow up on the farm? I mean, uh, you know, track, you know, you have an eighty thousand dollar track. Remember, you came home one day and Dad came by and you said, "Yeah, Dad, I I, I blew up your eighty thousand dollar tractor because God told me." No, uh, <laughs> go kill your dad's ox. So that's good. So and Gideon, he had to take a step of faith, and he didn't know what was going to happen next. Uh, he, he he didn't know. How about Elijah? Well, Elijah at one point, Jezebel is after him, um, and she's you know, killing prophets, and, and he thinks he's all alone, and nobody, talk about a ministry that is not very successful. He is preaching and preaching and preaching, and nobody is listening, and he finally just has to run. He finds himself out in the wilderness all by himself. He goes, God, just kill me. I want to die. Um, you know, I don't know if in the scripture, if we have quite an overt suicidal, a lot of people say that King David was suicidal a lot, but Elijah was asking God to kill him. He was the Lord, just, just kill me, kill me and die. I, I don't want to be a part of this. And then God says, Hey, it's not as bad as you think. And of course, then he goes on to defeat the prophets of Baal. How cool is that? But he didn't see God's hand. And I have noticed <clears throat> that it is a lot easier to see God's hand working, looking backwards than it is looking forwards. Because the reality is, is that he doesn't tell us what he's doing. He doesn't tell us what he's doing. And, and we get frustrated. I don't know about you. I get really, God, I could have so much faith if you just told me what to do. <laughs> Lord, if you just, just let me know. <laughs> I have this little prayer. If you've been hanging out with me, uh, you've heard me pray this probably for you or with you or whatever. It's like, God, please guide me with a firm, gentle hand. And every time I pray it, I, I, this is the image that comes in my head when I pray that prayer. It's that image of Star Wars where Luke, Han, and Leah are in the, Leia are in the trash compactor. And the trash compactor is coming in on both sides, okay? And um, it's coming in, and, 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 and if you push against that wall, if you just stand in the middle, you don't notice anything. If you just, you know, walk away from that wall slowly, you don't, but when you try to push against that wall, it was absolute. So I thought, God, please guide me with a firm, because I'm a little dense, gentle hand. Because if you try to fight God, it just never goes very good. So God, please be gentle but firm. In other words, you know, so that was always, always prayed. But that's kind of a, God doesn't always answer that prayer. <laughs> I wish he did. And I'll keep on praying it because it's much easier when you have a, a word from God or you have a direction to go or whatever. Um, but we don't always have that. Well, and I mentioned King David. And, you know, if, if you want to be really depressed, you know, read some 
Psalms. If you want to be in a really good mood, you can read others of the Psalms. David was manic. Uh, uh, lots of people say that, that, that David was all over the place and, and manic. But never was David lower than the day that he was in the cave of Adullam. The cave of Adullam, he had already killed Goliath. He'd been running with his warriors. Things had gone pretty good. Then all of a sudden, he has to run away quick because Saul is trying to kill him. So he runs away and he finds himself in the cave of Adullam and it's in this cave where he, he writes some psalms that just make you think he's, just, he's lost it. I mean, this is not a guy who's coming back from this. And um, his men wanted to kill him. Uh, he was really feeling like a loser. Everything that he had been daydreaming about, it was all removed from him in that moment. <clears throat> and he couldn't see a way out. Now, of course, God saw a way out. But God didn't tell David what was going to happen next. All David had to go on was doing the next right thing. That's all he had. He, he, he just, he, he didn't, he had a promise that he was going to be king. You have a promise that God has a purpose and a plan for your life, a life of destiny, a life of, of influence. God, God has, a, he created you for a purpose and, and that is the truth. But, but he, doesn't, he doesn't tell you how it's gonna happen or how hard it's going to be. I think if he told us how hard it would be, I, I don't know that we'd always wanna go along quite so quick. How about, now you can't talk about this without talking about Job. Um, this, this poor guy. Now, you all know that Job had a bad time, but the book of Job is actually kind of a hard uh, book of the Bible to study because a huge portion of the book are idiots speaking, okay? So if you go in there and you don't realize that large portions of the book of Job are idiots speaking, and then you read the book of Job thinking you're going to get wisdom from the parts that are the idiots speaking, you're going to have trouble, okay? So just a little clue, if you're ever studying the book of Job, you got to know who's talking, okay? It's important. So the, so the scripture is infallible. The record of those idiots speaking, God completely intended they be in there. <clears throat> That's not to say they were right. A curse God and die, his wife says. That, what a woman that was. Job just cursed God and die. And then you get to the end of the book, and finally God speaks. Now that part is infallible. And God says, <coughs> he says to Job, because Job has been defending himself. Job is like, God, I didn't sin. You put all this on me, I never sinned once. And God's like, didn't sin? Who are you to tell me my business? And then he reams Job's butt. Can you put Leviathan on a fish hook? Okay, can you put the oceans in your hand and weigh them? Can you do that, Job? Huh? huh? So God chews Job out. You know, he does it pretty good. He just rips into Job. And then we get to the end of the book of Job. And you know what God does? Well, God restores Job. He gives him a new family. I hope he gave him a new wife. I, you know, it doesn't say that, but he could have used a new wife. Um, and, he, and he does it. But you know what is not in the book of Job? God never explains himself to Job. Now, we can assume that we learned a lot from Job, okay? How to be long-suffering. Though you slay me, I will, uh, I will love you, you know, Job says. And, um, and so we can, but, but for Job, he, he's never given an answer of why he had to go through all of that pain. So you're not better than Job today. I get pretty huffy with God. God, Why? Why do I have to, why are you doing this to me? If you love me, why is this so hard? But over and over in the scripture, we don't have a lot to stand on to say, God, you need to share with us. How about Peter? <coughs> right? Peter is chewed out by Jesus. Get behind me, Satan. How how would you like to have that happen? And then a little while later, Peter's, oh, Jesus, I would die for you. I would die for you. You know, and Jesus, no, you're going to deny me. Never, Lord. And then he does. And read, I think it's in the book of John. Um, but one of the gospels, uh, the rooster crows, and the scripture says that Peter looks up and makes eye contact with Jesus. Oh, man. Can you imagine? He, he locks eyes with the Christ who just prophesied he would betray him. And, and, but then... He goes and he, and, and he preaches. Uh, all of that happened. And he gets up in front of the Roman uh, rulers. He gets up in front of the Sanhedrin. And he says, you crucified the son of God. He didn't know how that was going to end. 
and it actually ended pretty well for him. He would eventually be killed. He was crucified himself, but he said, I am not worthy of being crucified in the same manner of Christ. So he was crucified upside down. That's how Peter died. <clears throat> and so the, the, if you've ever heard some uh, word and faith preaching that you know, the, the, if you love Jesus, your life is just going to be good, I, I can tell you the disciples did not go to that church. Just, just a little out there. Anyways, how about the Apostle Paul? You read through, and we've unpacked this in the past, um, but all the, these letters that Paul is writing, and, uh, and he says, hey, I want to come, and I want to go to Rome. And he talked about Rome. He always wanted to go to Rome because Paul had a dream of preaching in Rome because that was the hub of everything in the world. I mean, that was it. And so he was always wanting to go there as a preacher. But how does Paul finally go to Rome? He goes to Rome as a prisoner. And he gets to witness to one dude at a time because he was like chained to somebody. And so he had limited access, but he, then he got to write the letters. Oh, thank you, Jesus, that Paul was, was locked up because the theology that we got from his letters, this, this, this God thing would be much harder to figure out without Paul connecting the Old Testament with the New Testament and what it means and, and, and all of that. Um, but he wanted to go as a preacher. He went as a prisoner. You gotta know, you gotta believe that there were times when he said, really, God? Why? I mean, I could preach. Lord, if you let me preach, can you imagine a world where there was a Roman church and everybody was Christian? Because that turned out so well. Um, sorry, I don't know where that came from. <clears throat> but now I lost my train of thought. I'm so sorry. Okay, but there were days when he was saying, God, why, what? You know, I, he did not see what was coming next, and he never would because he too would lose his life. And he is beheaded without any fanfare because they didn't want him drawing a lot of attention and, and getting this Jesus thing out there. He was taken out on a hill, and he, he was, his head was cut off with nobody even there to watch. But if there was one guy in the scripture that I think had it the toughest, one guy in the scripture that had to have a, a saint's faith, which, you know, I guess he was probably a saint. And that's got to be John the Baptist. John the Baptist was Jesus' cousin. I go back and forth whether they grew up together or not. Because there's one part of the scripture where it says that it seems like they didn't know each other. Although I just have a really hard time believing that Elizabeth, uh, who was John the Baptist's mom, uh, Mary spent three months with Elizabeth while they were pregnant together. So the idea that they never played together, I just I kind of think they did. Um, but again, there is a one little verse in there that makes it seem like that maybe they didn't know each other. Um, so I, I think they talked to each other, but we could argue about that if you want. That'd be fun. The, um, but John is preaching about repentance. Preach because the kingdom of God is come. Repent. That was his message. We, we talked about that a little bit last week. Repent, repent, repent. And then one G day, Jesus comes down off the hill and John looks up and he says, behold, the Lamb of God, which has come to take away the sins of the world. So he had a pretty full theology of what was about to happen at that point, right? I mean, he, he, he kind of got it because he, he, he calls it. All that stuff that Paul would be unpacking later about the Old Testament sacrifice, the Messiah not being a military leader, but dying for our, on our behalf and making intercession with God. And, and, and he's, behold, and Jesus comes down and Jesus says, I'm going to be baptized. And John says, no, 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 you shouldn't be, I, you should be baptizing me. And, and they argue about it. And Jesus, no, you baptize me. Shut up, John. And, and so John <laughs> baptizes Jesus and then Jesus, from right that baptism, Jesus goes out into the wilderness and does a 40-day fast, and that's when he's tempted by the devil. And when he gets back again, he begins what we call his public ministry. He begins doing miracles. And he's out doing miracles, he's doing stuff, but John is still ministering. He's still baptizing down by the Jordan. He's still preaching about repentance. Now, the scripture doesn't record any of his sermons, <clears throat> 
after Jesus baptizes him, but we know he's still doing ministry because we know he has disciples. And so John is doing his thing, and apparently John did something that you're not supposed to do when you're in the ministry, and that is you called out sin in your leadership. It is, it's not right that you have your brother's wife, he says to this Roman guy. And so John is arrested because he called sin, sin, something that I think preachers ought to do, don't you? He calls sin, sin. He's arrested. He's brought into jail. And then, but he's, he's kept alive for a while. He's, just, he's all locked up. And, um, and, and John is rotting in prison. And a week goes by, two weeks go by. We don't really know how long, but we know it's a period of time. And uh, finally, Jesus is doing ministry one day, and he's healing people, and he's preaching, and, and, and he's making the Pharisees and the Sadducees angry. And, and some of John's disciples come and say, Jesus, we've got to talk to you. Jesus, um, John sent us. He's in jail, you know. Uh, he's in jail, and he sent us to ask you, are you the one that is supposed to come, or should we be expecting somebody else? Now, that statement, I don't know, you probably read it in your Bible, but just take for yourself for a little while that you are the preacher that got it all started, okay? You, you are in, in the spirit of Elijah. You're a Nazarite. You don't cut your hair. You, you ate locusts in the desert. And when the Messiah God came down from the hill, you were the one who had the honor of crying out, Behold, the Lamb of God who has come to take away the sin of the world. That was you, man. You baptized the Messiah, Son of God. And then he begins, so you gave, you gave him a start, right? But now you're sitting in prison, and you begin to doubt. If God, if this really is Jesus, how could he let me rot here? Why doesn't he get me out of here? He, he's because again, he had a, a, a theology of God at that point. He knew who Jesus was. He knew that Jesus could have shrugged his shoulders and he'd be out of jail. And there he sits. A and he gets so insecure about it that finally he calls his disciples over and says, guys, I, would you go and would you ask Jesus, are you really him? Or should we be expecting somebody else? And so his disciples, and you can imagine how, how their faith is shaken, and, and they go, and, and they, they come, and, and they ask Jesus. But as they're approaching Jesus, they're noticing some things. They're hearing stories. There are people who are blind that now they can see. They see some people who were lame, and now they can walk. They see all of these different people, and they see that there's, there's rich people, there's poor people, there's religious people, there's prostitutes, all different kinds of folks. And the disciples come to Jesus, are you the one, or should we expect someone else? And Jesus says, go back to John. And tell him the lame walk, the blind see, the gospel is preached to the poor. Knowing that that would be enough for John. He knew he would know what that meant because that's echoing what was said in Isaiah about Jesus. And so, and so they come back and, uh, and they tell John, John, this is what he said. And John's like, okay, then I guess God wants me here. And then there happens a party and you probably know the story. The wife of the dude that not the, you know, he married his brother's wife or something, and, and she didn't like John because he said that she was doing something bad, you know. And, and so her daughter does a strip tease. I mean, come on. And, and it gets uh, creepy. Her husband, or, uh, so uh, excited that he says, ask me for anything you want. And I'll give it to you. So the girl goes to her mom and says, what should I ask? And she says, ask for the head of John the Baptist. Now, the guy kind of liked John. He had, he'd listened to John things, you know. But he made this boast in front of all of his friends. And so they go back and they lead John out. And, they, and at least in the movie, they, they, they cut off his head and they put it on a platter. <laughs> I forget now if the scripture actually says it's a platter or if that's in all the movies. I'm not quite sure as I stand before you now. But um, John is never told why. John is never given hope that things are going to change for his situation. Indeed, they never do. 
But I have to believe, I absolutely believe, that when John heard that, go back and tell John, the blind see, the lame walk. The gospel is preached to the poor. That John said, okay, though you slay me, I will trust you. That was the prayer that Job landed on. God, I'm yours completely. You can give me comfort or you can give me poverty. You can give me pain or you can give me pleasure. God, all of it, I'm, I'm yours there and I'm yours there. Though you slay me, I will trust you. I believe that's what John said. Now, the year is now 2021 and 2020 was awful in all kinds of ways. Our crowd is small. The, uh, uh, a lot of our finances have been disrupted. People that we care about have died. Uh, and, you know, um, we can't do things the way we want to do them. We can't go where we want to go. We can't do what we want to do. There's an anxiety in people that is just icky. I don't know if you felt it, but there's, been, there's just been a wrongness in the back of our heads here for months. And I, there's, there's no answers. And so I told you last week that when we start our series on going through our visions, vision and values for the church, it's going to be a little harder right now because it's hard to make any plans because we don't even know. Right now, you feel guilty if you even invite somebody to church. Thank you for coming today. Thank you to all of you who are watching online. I know there's more than normal, because there's a whole lot that are just not ready to come back to church yet. And I'm not prepared to tell you you should. If, you know what I'm saying? So I, I'm, not, I'm not condemning anybody. Um, but it's a little hard to invite people to church when you, when you feel a little guilty about it. You know what I mean? How do you, how do you promote church? Hey, everybody come. And then, you, you know, well, I'm not going this COVID. No, you really should. You know, take a chance on Jesus. You know, it doesn't play very well. And so it's hard to do ministry. How do you, how do you have prayer meetings? You don't get to lay hands on people and cry and snot and stuff. How do you, how do you, uh, right now we have men's retreat coming up and they are doing men's retreat. Um, but I don't know what it's going to look like in February. That's when our men's retreat is. But I'll be honest with you. Um, putting uh, six guys all sleeping in bunks in a small room in the COVID world, I'm not sure that's a great idea. Uh, and so I, I don't know what I'm, we're going to do. Or if we'll say, you know, come. If we do, it'll be, hey, come at your own risk, <laughs> you know. Um, I don't know. Everything is wrong right now. Nothing is good. Everything sucks. Lord, take my life. No, I'm not there. But there have been some days and I bet there have been some days for you when things didn't go according to plan, things were broken, maybe some of you have lost employment, maybe some of you have been, and, and things are just kind of bad. But tell you what, um, is it any wonder why all of them had to take a step of faith? Well, look at this. Hebrews 11.6, it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. You see, we have a promise. John had a promise. Abraham had a promise. Job had a promise that we can hold on to. Jesus said, my kingdom come. When Jesus talked about his kingdom come, was he talking about you driving a nicer car? No. Was he talking about having a nation that feared and loved God? No. His kingdom come that Jesus preached was heaven. It was the new Jerusalem where you will live in a resurrected body. The streets are made of gold. The gates is made out of one huge pearl. There's no more shame. There's no more sickness. There's no more pain. There's no more jealousy. And best of all, I'm not going to be tempted anymore. I am going to be set free, fully sanctified, fully made right. That is the king. That is the reward of those who sincerely seek him. This was written by Paul. Some people don't think it was written by Paul. I think Paul wrote Hebrews. Um, so the guy who wrote this would die in prison or on a hill with his head cut off. What's his reward? His reward is an eternity with Jesus. 
in eternity with Jesus. I don't know if we're going to do the song here. There's a brand new song out by that Feliz, uh, Feliz guy. He's the same guy that did uh, uh, the water song that we do here in church. Um, but he's got a new one out called Jesus is Coming Back. Uh, it's, it's very hip hoppy, so I don't know if I got it in me. Uh, but maybe we'll just put a rock guitar on top of it and, and do it anyway. Um, but I was pretty encouraged when I saw the album and that that was the title track on the album, like the main track on the album. Because one good thing that happens when the world goes to crap is that all of a sudden people turn their eyes to God. I don't know what to do. <laughs> but I really believe that God is not going to let this opportunity pass my community by. So I don't know what it looks like yet. But I think that God is going to give us a way to wiggle our way into lives because we have the hope that they're looking for. It's Jesus. That is the hope. That is what we have. And so here, here is my grand plan is I want to make Jesus smile today. To make him smile, I have to show faith. In our faith journey, there's always a step of faith. And just like all those heroes when their faith was shaken, if you have all the answers, you don't have faith. And so God, God smiles when you take a step of faith. If he gave you all the answers, it wouldn't be any fun for him. <laughs> and I live for his pleasure. Keep me in the dark, God. But Lord, just give me you. Punching the light switch. I was going to share with you a story of a time when I came unglued, but I don't have time because I had too much fun with other things. So keep coming to church, and I'll tell you about the time that I smashed a light switch. I was so angry and out of faith. But I don't have time to tell the story now. Maybe not as good as the time I threw the milk jug against the wall. But anyway. Um, that QR code will bring up all the notes that you've seen on the screen today, including the videos and things. Um, but I'm going to pray today. And if you're here and you need to bring your life back to where it needs to be with God, agree with my prayer. Just, I'm just going to give him my life and I invite you to give him your life at the same time. And I'm also going to pray for Rock Church. You see... We believe that people without Jesus go to hell. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, the life, and the only way to get to God. One of my greatest frustrations right now is it's really hard to know how to do ministry because everything we've ever done, it doesn't work right now. And so, but I'll promise you this is I'm going to keep throwing spaghetti against the wall until something sticks. And, uh, and I'm a tenacious son of a gun if I'm nothing else. And uh, we're just going to do what we can. And anybody who walks in our door, we're going to love on them. You don't have to believe to belong at the rock. And so they can come all messed up, unconditional love. You don't got to change a thing for us to respect, love, like, and enjoy you. There's no bar for that. And that's what I like about Nicodemus. You see, Jesus was really rude to most Pharisees. He was a jerk. Uh, the Sadducees, he beat up all their tables and he whipped them and stuff. But the Pharisees, he was just, he would go mind games with them all the time. And, um, but with Nicodemus, he uses puns, but he's also, read that conversation, he's very gentle with Nicodemus. He, he doesn't go right for the throat and tear, because, why? Because Nicodemus had an open heart. And so Jesus didn't focus on sinners on purpose, but they're the ones who tend to listen the best. But Nicodemus got it. And I think that we're going to have opportunities to have conversations and that God can do some really beautiful, deep things and some wonderful people. And so, I just want to make him smile. So pray with me. Lord, I just ask God that you would help us in 21 that every day that our foot goes out, it would land in the spot that you want it to be. Lord, so you put your fingers on our hearts, on our character, on our hearts, our minds. Nothing in me is off limits to you. I want you to make me into the man that you need me to be so that I can do what you want me to do because people without you go to hell. Help me, and you help me, Jesus, when you change my character. 
you help me, Jesus, when you set me free from sin. You help me, Jesus, when you give me wisdom to be tempted less. You help me when you inspire me to dive into your word. So Jesus, help me to be what you want me to be. And Lord, I recognize when I look at your word that me being is more important than me doing. I want my doing to flow out of my being because the doing, boy, what if John was all hung up on the doing and he died in prison? How about Paul when he went out and he'd just been writing a bunch of letters to people? What, what if they got caught up in the being? So God, I pray that we would be caught up in the being. Lord, that we would focus on the being and out of us would flow life. Anybody who gets in the splash zone, they would just get to feel your presence, Jesus. Let that be us personally. Let uh, that be us, Rock Church. Give us the message that we need. Well, we have the message. You are the message our community needs. God, I pray you make us just sloppy and spill on them. And Lord, if you want to kick in some creative ideas to get your gospel in front of people, we'll do that too because we'll do anything short of sin to tell somebody about you, Jesus. Have your way, God. In Jesus' name, we love you, Lord. Amen, amen. Jesus was a rock star.